Hello, and welcome to online worship at White Bear Lake United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Bill Eves, and along with Pastor John McBride, I thank you for joining us today. If you're watching on Facebook, please take a moment to click share so that your friends can be a part of this service as well. Today, we continue our series of sermons based on the book, Holding Up Your Corner, looking next at what it means to see, hear, and try to understand a perspective that is different from our own. It's the mission of this church to provide nourishment for the hungers of life. We believe that God is with us today, nourishing our hungers and showing us ways to bring hope to the world around us. Now, let's be in worship together.
Good morning. I'm Reverend Cynthia Williams, and I serve as superintendent of the River Valley District of the Minnesota Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. And it is my pleasure this morning to lead you in prayer. Let us pray. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of your hands. And so Lord, we join with all creation, praising your majesty, your power, and all encompassing greatness. Lord, we come this day telling the truth, carrying many emotions, joy, fear, peace, unrest, calm, and turbulence. Lord, we are at peace and we are unsettled. We're seeking to keep our eyes fixed on you and we are disoriented. Lord, we come satisfied and thirsty. We come filled and we come hungry. Lord, what are we to do? What are we to make of it all? Lord, we simply turn our eyes, we turn our hearts to you, and we join with the psalmist, asking the question, where does our help come from? We lift our eyes to the hills. <laughs> our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord will not let our feet slip. Our God who watches over us will not slumber. Indeed, Jehovah who watches over all creation will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over us. The Lord is our shade at our right hand. The sun will not harm us by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep us from all harm and will watch over our lives. The Lord will watch over our coming and our going both now and forevermore. So Lord, this prayer, we ask it in your mercy, in your steadfast and enduring love and in your enduring promise. In all this, we give thanks. And so now join me in the prayer that we wrap up and we pray with all the disciples all over the world. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, and I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Imagine that you have to go to the emergency room with a severe pain in your stomach. You wait patiently, trying to find a comfortable position just to sit, trying to take deep breaths, trusting that before much longer you would get help and relief. Only that's not what happens. When you're finally called to an examining room, the medical personnel chat about how quiet it's been in the emergency room that night. Nothing much is going on. You wonder, was there no reason I should have had to wait so long? When a couple of doctors come to consult with you, they seem impatient, short with you, and not at all interested in helping. You feel the desperation inside you growing. 
your voice begins to get thin, to turn into a wail and then a pleading. They shrug and say they don't see any problem and say they'll just be sending you back home. Imagine what it would be like to be left not only with physical pain, with the anger and frustration of having been first ignored and then not taken seriously, but to have even your cries of pain ignored or shrugged off. And imagine if your whole family had to endure that pain over several generations with no possible relief and no end in sight. When life is hard, a cry of pain rises up in us. When things become so bad that there is no option to be quiet any longer, a primal cry emerges from deep inside. Even when no one is listening, the voice lifts up the pain, the hurt. To express pain is a part of being human. This old, old story has a very familiar ring to it, and it has been replayed in many versions throughout human history and continues right up to today. For the ancient Hebrew people we find in the book of Exodus, it went something like this. Pharaoh, the monarch of Egypt, has great power and privilege and wants to hold on to it, of course. And so he sets out to use violence to oppress the people at the bottom of the social ladder, the very people upon whose backs much of his wealth has been achieved. In a kind of paranoia common to people obsessed with holding on to power, he sets out to crush the Hebrews in an attempt to render them incapable of rising up in revolt, finding ways to weaken them as a people, to keep them in their place. In the story of the Exodus, God is revealed to be a God of compassion who sees their misery, hears the cries of his suffering people under Pharaoh's cruel oppression, and who is at work in the lives of the people to bring about their liberation, to deliver them from slavery. God has seen their misery and heard their cry. God has felt their pain and paid attention to their prayers for deliverance. The Jewish people today say this is one of the most important teachings about God, that God hears and acknowledges the sufferings of people. But they say the problem was that although God heard, Pharaoh did not hear and did not acknowledge the people's suffering. People of color in this country are crying out for their future, for their dignity, and for their lives in ways that most other people cannot imagine. The call of our faith today is to have our hearts broken open wider in compassion. To get there, we have to listen. But if we fail to listen, and if we can't see and can't hear what is wrong, then we will stay unaware, indifferent. I want to challenge us to hear, as we find in the book of Exodus that God hears. And when black people say they are experiencing persecution from the systems of our society, we need to say we believe it. When black people say they want the same rights as white people have, we need to say you deserve that. When black people say they are being treated in some sectors as something less than human, we need to come alongside them and say we affirm that you have God-given dignity and worth, and we will help you in the struggle because we believe that justice, peace, and wholeness are God's dream for this world. If we're unable to make this affirmation in our own hearts and minds, then we cannot say with any authenticity that all lives matter or all lives have inherent worth and dignity. If we can't look into the eyes of those who are crying out in pain and offer them compassion, we are not being true to ourselves. If we're unwilling to stand with the hurting, to stand on the side of love, then our faith is meaningless. 
as our country celebrated the 4th of July, we remember the story of how our forefathers in the Second Continental Congress gathered in Philadelphia with their powdered wigs and dreams of liberty and declared their colony's independence from Great Britain. Those dreams of liberty that had been in the hearts of many before them, at least since the Mayflower Pilgrims, came closer to being realized on that day. Some people also remember another story. In 1619, a ship called the White Lion dropped anchor near Port Comfort, Virginia, and around 20 Africans were sold there as slaves. They had been farmers, herders, blacksmiths, and artisans, and along with their skills, they also brought their culture, language, and beliefs that would shape the development of crop cultivation and culture for years to come. While there were very likely slaves elsewhere in the colonies already, this arrival from Angola on the west coast of Africa is the first recorded landing from Africa and represents the beginning of the slave trade in America. This part of the story has seldom been told or taught as a part of our history. On December 1st, 1955, when Rosa Parks got on a bus after work at a Montgomery, Alabama department store, she was told by the driver to get up and give her seat to a white man and move to the back. Later, she said many times that people sometimes think she did it that day because she was tired. But she made it clear that she wasn't physically tired. She was tired of giving in. Black people today are tired. Tired of losing their history, tired of the racism, tired of the struggle, tired of trying to improve substandard education, tired of trying to change unjust laws that produce economic inequality, tired of pointing out the need for criminal justice reform, tired of the tears, tired of the cries, tired of trying to get people who look like me to understand, and not just to understand, and then go back to life as usual, but to understand in a way that changes things for all of us. And this can only happen when we come closer together, when white people get close enough to black people and other people of color that their cry becomes our cry, their pain becomes our pain. And let's be very clear about this. That is the Christian faith. Sharing in the experience of others is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That's what it means to claim that we love and serve a God who sees the misery and hears the cries of God's people. It means that we look at the world with the eyes of love as those with which God looks at us. It means that we hear the cries of this world with the ears of compassion with which God hears. In the cries of communities of color, we hear the voice of the Spirit calling us to participate in God's work of mercy and justice. We hear the voice calling us together to be an anti-racist church that will not only affirm that black lives matter, but will give substance to that affirmation in the things we do as a community of faith. How do we incarnate? How do we give flesh to this affirmation? As a church, we can do it by the decisions we make about our life together, where we give our mission dollars and our volunteer service time, how we interpret the Bible beyond our own limited perspective, what we preach on, what voices we amplify, who we hire, we can do it by educating ourselves about racism and the concerns of black people and by partnering with black churches and other organizations. How we respond right now will have consequences for decades and centuries to come. The stakes are high. So this means that we look again at Jesus and realize that he spent the majority of his time with those who were marginalized those who were disconnected, those who were disengaged 
from the faith community, those who were abused by the systems in which they lived. Because he could see their misery and he could hear their cries. Go back with me again to that hospital emergency room where your pain was not being taken seriously, where your cries were being ignored by the people who had the ability to help you, where your options were becoming fewer and your desperation was becoming greater. Now imagine a different scenario. A doctor sits down next to you, looks you in the eye, and asks you to tell her exactly what's going on. She listens patiently as you try to find the right words to describe the pain. She nods with understanding as you describe the symptoms. When you express the seriousness of it, her face assures you that she gets it. She is hearing you. She says to you with confidence, I don't know exactly what's going on here or what this is like for you, but we're going to do all we can to help you get some relief. People who are hurting need to be affirmed in their hurt. People who are angry need to be affirmed in their anger. This way of listening and hearing one another is called empathy. Empathy begins not with speaking, but with listening. It is a core value of human relationship and community. Our listening, our attention to stories, is a manifestation of grace. It's in the story of grace and the listening to each other that we begin to acknowledge the justice-related challenges all around us and affirm those who are marginalized, oppressed, and silenced in both our churches and our communities. So we turn toward our community to notice who is devalued. We have the conversations we need to have. We acknowledge that we may feel uncertain, fearful, inadequate, or whatever it is we're feeling. We tell the people crying out that we see the pain. We hear the cry. We want to understand. We want to be there for them. We want to be faithful to the God of love who hears the cries. Amen. Yeah.
Our online greeter today is Steve Peterson, and we're here in the community garden this morning. Hello, Steve. Hi there. And uh, Steve, tell us about community gardens. We have about 100 plots here on the east side of our church property, and Larry and Denise Kerr are the managers, I guess we'd say, and they do an excellent job. What I like about the community garden is that it is a small microcosm of our community, uh, our extended community, not only White Bear, but it goes into uh, Maplewood, maybe east side of St. Paul, some people live. And I've got neighbors from El Salvador, from uh, Africa, from Honduras, Mexico, and, uh, and of course, uh, Minnesota, White Bear Lake. But I've learned a lot from them and uh, trying to teach me about uh, how to use plants and how to make them grow better. Great, tell, uh, tell us what you have in your garden here. Oh, in my garden, well, my garden has expanded because Patty wanted to grow squash. So we had to get another plot. And we have one tiny little squash over there, but we started with radishes and they're done now. We've added beets, we've got onions, snap peas, the tall ones, we keep having to add uh, an extra string because they keep growing taller. We've got some peppers, banana pepper growing there, six tomato plants. We've got herbs, dill. We've got a Japanese green bean here that just lost two beautiful flowers yesterday in the rainstorm where they changed. Maybe they're growing their beans. They're gonna be 18 inches long. Uh, red beans from Alda and Ignacio who gave me the beans, so I planted them. I've got green beans and I have sunflowers I started through the about eight, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years I've been here and I keep getting the, all these little volunteers that come up. So I don't know what I'm gonna get, but they're looking pretty sturdy this uh, summer. Got cucumbers and uh, I add a few flowers. I like zinnias because Patty does, and marigolds to keep the little animals away. So that's what I have, or we have. Thanks for talking to us and happy gardening. Thank you for joining us for worship today. If you're interested in exploring more about the topic of today's message, I invite you to join us for a discussion and learning group on the best-selling book, White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. You can find information on our website about how to sign up for a group. There will be both in-person and online options. And now, may God bless your eyes with clear vision. May God strengthen your soul with courage. May God fill your heart with love that you may go forth to do the healing work of love today and every day. Amen.
Drunk with the wine of the world, we forget.